Can you do me a favor um, and turn to the person or two people next to you and say, I am super grateful that you are here. I am super grateful that you are here. Can you say it to the next person? I'm trying to look something up really bad. I am super grateful that you are here. I'm trying to look up this song that I remember as a, as a kid that we used to sing for Sunday school. It was like a Thanksgiving song. And I remember as a kid we used to sing it all the time. Let's see. There it is. Okay. So it goes. It goes. Some of you are going to laugh because it's like a pretty upbeat and funny song. And it goes like this. Uh, and my apologies if my voice is like hoarse and I don't sound good and if it cracks because uh, I've been like in bed super sick for the last three days. I haven't really gotten up. Uh, so if my voice sounds terrible, please forgive me. It goes like this. If I were a butterfly, I thank you, Lord, that I could fly. And if I were robbing in the tree, I thank you, Lord, that I could see. And if I were a fish in the sea, I'd wiggle my tail and I'd giggle and flee. But I just thank you, Father, for making me me. Because you gave me a heart and you gave me a smile. You gave me Jesus and you gave me a child. And I just thank you, Father, for making me be. Amen. I'm super grateful that you're here today. Um, and I believe that this message that I'm about to share with you all is, is really relevant. And it really has helped me personally. Um, and I'm grateful to see some faces that I haven't seen in a while. So I'm grateful to see you all. And, and like I, I want to relay the sentiments, I'm really grateful to be a part of this family. I'm really grateful for, for what God's doing in this church, and I'm super grateful for this opportunity to share this message with you. So our scripture is found in Colossians chapter three, verses 15 to 17. You got your Bible on you? I hope. If you don't have it on you, it should pop up on the screen. I wish there was somebody over there that could actually go to where it should be, but if, I mean, okay. Thank you. Um, just for those who don't have a Bible, so that if you came to church and didn't bring a Bible, we're, we're, we're free and open for anybody who wants to come and fellowship with us. So, Colossians chapter 3, verses 15 to 17. Let's read it all together. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly, as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom. Through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in your hearts, and whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. All right. If I want to propose to you a scenario before I start preaching. And I want you to think about your response to this scenario. And I've given uh, this scenario to the youth group. So if you have somebody in the youth group that has heard this scenario and knows the answer to this question or, or has the response that I thought, uh, please don't spoil it for those who have not participated in this activity. So the scenario is this. Imagine if somebody gave you $100 million, just came up to you and gifted you $100 million. What would be the first thing that you did? Think about it, don't answer aloud, we're gonna come back to it. What would be the first thing that you did? All right? With that being said, um, there was this guest preacher who came to our church a couple of years ago, and uh, he preached a message that was really great and really profound, and it really spoke to me as somebody who's very interested in ministry. And his message was entitled, An Attitude, of gratitude. And he talked about how gratitude should be an attitude that we take on as Christians. We shouldn't just be people who live with an attitude of, you know, ungratefulness, but we should be people with an attitude of gratitude. And it was really profound, and I love the message. I love the delivery of the message. It was one of my favorite pre-Thanksgiving messages that I've ever heard. But as I've grown a little more personally and in my faith, 
I'd like to tell that pastor if I ever see him again about his message. No disrespect, I love the message, love the delivery, but I feel as if that message was incomplete. And no disrespect to that pastor, but the reason why I think that it's incomplete is the reason um, that I've titled my message the way that I have. And my message for you this evening is entitled, Gratitude is More than an attitude. Could you turn to two or three people, give them a high five and announce my message title for this evening? Gratitude is more than an attitude. All right. And before um, I preach this message, I'd like to share a moment of prayer with you. Lord God, as I prepare to preach this message, I ask that I decrease so that you may be increased, Father God. May somebody who walks in these doors tonight be inspired by this message and go forth and never be the same through the transforming power of your message through the work of the Holy Spirit. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Amen. To all my parents, nod your head or wave at me if you agree with the following statement. There are few things that irritate you more than when your kid has an attitude. Yeah. Parents get real frustrated when your kid, I heard uh, Robert say amen, right? <laughs> it, it is very irritating. I'm not a parent yet, but I'm sure, I'm sure, uh, I'm, I'm gonna understand when I get there that, that when your kid gives you attitude, it is very, very frustrating. In my household, when one of, uh, when one of myself or my siblings give my parents, or especially my mom, an attitude, my mom looks at us and she calls us by our fir entire first name. You know, as a kid, if you get called by your entire first name, if you have a nickname, you're in trouble, right? She goes, especially to me, she goes, Alisana, are you giving me attitude? That's the question that she asks me. Now, it's not a question. Are you giving me attitude is not a question. It's more of a threat. If you are giving me attitude, then there are repercussions that come with your attitude. You fill in the blank what those consequences are, right? But I think the principle stands in general. There are a few things worse than people with a bad attitude, right? There are a few things worse than somebody who just has a terrible attitude. A terrible attitude is one way to ensure that you don't get a customer service job. A bad attitude is one way to ensure that you will not maintain a friendship with somebody. A terrible attitude is one way to ensure that your marriage doesn't last long. A bad attitude is one way to ensure that your relationship, even to God, doesn't last long. And in this season of gratitude, I think an attitude of gratitude is great. I love that we as people can come together and have a, an attitude of gratitude towards what God has done for us and just being grateful for all of the things that have happened. But the problem that I find with an, an attitude of gratitude isn't gratitude. It's the attitude part of it. See, because I found that there are two problems with an attitude of gratitude. There may be more, but I, in my research, I found that there are two. The first problem that I have with an attitude of gratitude is, number one, my attitude changes depending on when you find me or when you catch me. There are some days when my attitude is good and some days when my attitude isn't so great. There are some days when our attitudes are great and everything is sunshine and roses. And then there are days where our attitude is cloudy and rainy and our attitude isn't where it needs to be. Sometimes our attitude sucks in general, right? Our attitude changes and moves and is fluid depending on our mood, depending on our feelings. And the second problem that I found with an attitude of gratitude is that I can fake an attitude. I can make it seem like I'm really happy to be here, but on the inside, I'm really struggling. I'm happy to be here today, right? But there, we can fake attitudes. I'm sure there's somebody in here who when you got here, you were super grateful to be here. You're giving people hugs and high fives. But on the way here on Fulton Road, a, a silver Honda Civic cut you off and you were saying every expletive in the book. See, that's why 
an attitude of gratitude I find struggle with because number one, my attitude changes depending on my feelings, depending on my mood, but the second thing is my attitude also is, is, is able to be faked. I can fake an attitude. And so I believe that we need something more. Yeah, I think an attitude of gratitude is great, I love it, especially in this season of year, but I need something more. I need gratitude to be a way of life. I need gratitude to be something that I can hold on to even when I can't hold on to anything else. I need to be grateful in all situations and all circumstances. I need the joy of the Lord to be the basis of my gratitude. And so with that being said, I'd like to propose to you that gratitude Gratitude should not be an attitude, but an attribute. Some of you are looking confused, like he's using a big word, attribute. Some of the kids are probably like, that's one of those video game words, right? Somebody say, gratitude is an attribute. Gratitude is an attribute. And here's what an attribute is. An attribute can be defined as a quality or feature regarded as a characteristic or inherent part of someone or something. <coughs> Excuse me. But here's an easier way to put it. Gratitude is a characteristic or a part of who you are. For example, there are some people in this room tonight who are quiet. That's a characteristic of who you are. You're more introverted. And there are some people in this room who are generally loud. You're extroverted. That's a characteristic of who you are. And God has given each and every one of us special characteristics that make up who you are, make you special, make you different from everybody else. That's not a bad thing. But then there are also the characteristics that we learn that aren't inherent, that we're not born with, but that we learn. And I think gratefulness and gratitude is one of those things. None of us were born grateful. When you were born, you were born screaming your head off. We were not born grateful. We had to learn how to be grateful. For all my parents, I feel like I'm picking on the parents today. When you had a three or four year old kid and they were throwing a fit, your kid was not born grateful. They had to learn to be grateful. And what Paul is challenging us to do in Colossians chapter three, verses 15 to 17, is to be grateful. In 1 Thessalonians chapter five, verse 18, he says, be grateful in all situations, right? And in Colossians chapter three, he's asking us to do the same thing. We should store thanksgiving in our hearts in all situations. Because as what a bunch of people mentioned earlier, all that God has done for us, the only thing we can do is give him thanks and praise for what he's done for us. And yes, there will be times and situations in which gratitude isn't one of the first emotions that we feel. And that's why I think context for this passage is everything. Do you know where Paul wrote this passage, where he wrote the letter to Colossae from? He wrote the letter to Colossae from a prison. How is a guy who's writing from prison telling people who are free to be thankful? Isn't that interesting? That that concept of somebody who's in prison telling people who seemingly have everything to be thankful. And what I found is that some of the most grateful people that I've ever met are the people, the same people who at some point in time didn't have much at all. I remember as a kid for Christmas, I know as kids when we get Christmas presents and you see them wrapped up, you always go for the biggest Christmas present. And you don't, you leave the little ones alone, right? If it's a gift card, you don't, the little kids don't go for the gift cards, they go for the big extravagant toys. And so I did the same thing when I was uh, about seven or eight years old. We had Christmas since I woke. And my parents had bought me this big present and I went and I opened up the biggest one to find it was a toy airplane. 
It was remote controlled toy airplane. I was so stoked about that airplane. So I put in the batteries, started flying it. And that same day, I crashed into a bush and broke my airplane. And I was so mad. I said, oh my gosh, I just got this airplane. It broke. And I went and told my parents, I said, can I get another one? They said, no. But they said, you got another present that you didn't even open up yet. <coughs> and so I said, all right. Went back and, and looked under the tree. And there was a small Christmas present tucked under the tree that I had, didn't even mind to open because I was opening all the big ones. And this present was, um, it was wrapped and it looked like my my hand and then halfway or like a little past this part of my wrist and I opened it and what I found was a paddle ball you guys know what a paddle ball is some of the little kids are like what the heck is a paddle ball a paddle ball is a piece of wood with the string and a ball attached to it and you you hit the, the ball against the piece of wood T's laughing because those are see and I know that the, the older generation is laughing because, see, I didn't like the gift. You know, when you get a gift and you're like, oh, thank you. But you didn't really, you know, that's not what I was expecting. You know, that's the kind of gift that I got. See, but like that same day, my parents started playing with the paddle ball more than me. Because I didn't know how to use the paddle ball, but my, apparently my parents were pros at paddle ball. They played paddle ball back in the day, I guess. You see, but what I failed to realize, my parents eventually told me, was that both of them came from families that couldn't afford toy airplanes. They couldn't afford action figures. So the paddle ball meant so much to them because their parents were willing to think of them so much to buy them a gift. So that's how important it was to them, that they actually got a gift. Here I am feeling spoiled about all of the gifts that I have, and they're just grateful for the little gift that they have. The paddle ball had so much significance to them because they had nothing growing up. And I think the principle stands for us as Christians. Are we going to be grateful for the things that we have instead of the great and extravagant things that we constantly want? Let's be grateful as Christians for all of the little things that God has done in our lives. Health, the little things that we seemingly tend to forget about from day to day. God has blessed us with so much. The paddle ball meant so much to my parents that I couldn't even get it. And some of us aren't even thinking about the ways in which God has blessed us. That when you're 40, 50 years old, you're like, man, I, man, I'm grateful to God for the time when I could walk and not have my knee pain. We need to be grateful for all of the little ways in which, the seemingly at least little ways in which God has blessed us. They are so numerous that we couldn't even imagine or comprehend the ways in which God has blessed us. The paddle ball meant so much to them. And the seemingly little things matter. You see, when gratitude is an attribute and not an attitude, I've graduated from gratitude into this gratefulness. I think that there's a difference between gratitude and gratefulness. You see, I go from being a person who shows gratitude from time to time to being a grateful person. There's a difference because gratitude is something that I give or something that I show from time to time. But grateful is a part of who I am. I want to be a grateful giver. I want to be a grateful Christian. I want to be a grateful son. I want to be a grateful nephew. I want to be a grateful person. And when Paul writes in verse 17, he says, whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to the God, the father through him. And when Paul writes verse 17, when he uses the word thanksgiving, he mentions a very special and specific word. And the word is eucharistios in Greek. If you look in the original Greek, it's eucharistios. Can somebody say eucharistios? Eucharistios is to give thanks. Now, there are very there are very few other times in the Bible which the word the Greek word Eucharistios is used. But one of the one of the times where it's used 
is when Jesus broke bread during the Last Supper and gave it to his disciples. When we do the communion ceremony once a month, the pastor says, Jesus broke bread. And then what did he do after? And after giving thanks, gave it to his disciples. The word is that Jesus, that, that is written, is Eucharistios. Jesus gave thanks. And the way that it correlates in my mind is that Paul must have thought back. He didn't, he wasn't there for the Last Supper, but he must have thought back to how he heard about Jesus giving thanks. And he said, I want to be more like Jesus in what I do. And so when we give thanks as Christians, when we give thanks to God for what he has done, you are acting more and more and more like Jesus. And who doesn't want to act more like Jesus? When you start to give thanks in all situations, in all circumstances, you start to mimic the very act that Jesus did. Amen? And you see, one of the ways or keys in order for gratitude to become an attitude is consistency. You see, you've got to be grateful when no one appreciates you back. You've got to be grateful when no one acknowledges you. You've got to be grateful when no one commends you for what you've done. You've got to be grateful at all times. And I must admit that consistency is hard. But one thing that helps me is that I find inspiration from people who are consistent. And it gives me an extra boost because when I see an example of consistency, it makes me want to be more consistent in my walk. For example, we like in our society, the story of the underdog, right? Have you seen Rocky or The Little Giants or any movie where there was an underdog and they came up and beat the powerhouse? Well, I used to be, really uh, in love and enamored with the underdog, but now I'm more interested in consistent excellence. I, I'm not gonna lie, I actually kind of admire the New England Patriots for being so dominant for so long. Like, it's consistent greatness. And in church, I think we should often take the time and the energy to thank those who spend time and have the energy and, and use their own personal resources to help out in the ministries that we have in this church. See, without the people in our church who give their time and effort on a consistent basis, we as a church would not be here today. We as a church would not have been able to accomplish so much because of God. All of this stuff was possible because of God and because of all of the people who answered and said yes to God. In the same way, we've got to practice consistent gratitude. So in this Thanksgiving, I'm grateful. I'm grateful for the unsung heroes at our church who don't get acknowledged for all of those works for all of their hard work. And to them, I say thank you. I'm grateful for the single mother who takes care of her children, even though she doesn't understand how she's gonna make ends meet. To her, I say thank you. And I'm grateful for the father who's trying to raise his kids and trying to be the man of the household when he didn't see a father, when he didn't have a father figure. And to that father, I say thank you. I'm grateful for the daughter who never saw anyone in her family make it through school and she's trying her absolute best to make it. And she's doing so on a consistent level. To her, I say thank you. To the son who sacrificed so much time and energy caring for his siblings because his parents were working so hard. To that person, I say thank you. And most importantly, I'm thankful for a God who is my provider my healer, my banner, my rock, and my fortress. I'm grateful that there's no one besides my God. He is great and greatly to be praised. He's both caring and consistent. And give me some kind of in indication if God has, or if you're grateful that God has brought you out of some things. 
If God has brought you out of some things, if God brought you out of that toxic relationship, if God brought you out of the pit and put you in a sheltered place, if God has done some amazing things for you and brought you out of some difficult situations, you should be grateful. But more importantly, I'm more grateful when God has brought me through situations. When I've gone through difficulty, when I've seen struggle, when I've walked through the valley of the shadow of death and came out to find that God was the other side, that he was with me the entire time. I was grateful for the nights of mourning when I found that joy came in the morning. You see, because God has brought each and every one of us through situations, not just out of situations, but through situations. And it's the same predicament that the 10 lepers dealt with in Luke chapter, uh, Luke chapter 17, verses 11 through 19. Are you familiar with that story? Remember that story where, the, where Jesus told the 10 lepers to go to the temple and all 10 of them were healed. But how many came back to say thank you? One. Only one came back to thank you. And oftentimes we think about when we talk about the story, we think about the perspective of the lepers. And we say, how could those lepers be so ungrateful for what Jesus has done for them? You see, but this year I've read it from a different lens. I tried to read it from Jesus's perspective. Have you ever felt like people are ungrateful for all of the things that you do for them? Have you ever felt unnoticed and, 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 not thanked. See, when I read this passage, I have a new lens. I'm like, when I was reading it, I said, man, I wonder what it must have felt like to be Jesus and to heal those 10 people and to see that only one of them came to thank him, right? And I wonder, I wonder how I would have reacted if I was in Jesus's position. Like, I probably would have been so mad that they didn't come back to thank me we would have been like, fine, be like that. Or one of my friends goes, wow, wow. After all I did for you, that's what you're gonna do for me? I had a friend who, uh, every time he did something for somebody and they didn't say thank you, he would go, you're welcome. He opened the door for somebody, they walk in and don't say thank you. He goes, yeah, you're welcome for that. That's probably how I would have reacted when only one leper came back to thank Jesus. It must have been so frustrating. But I realized this when I was reading it and I got fresh insight into this passage. You see, Jesus was acting out of calling and not clout. Jesus wasn't looking for popularity. Jesus wasn't doing it for likes. Jesus wasn't looking, doing it so that he could get it shared on Facebook. Jesus did it because he was called by God and that was his mission. And so my encouragement for you today, if you are feeling undervalued and people aren't grateful for what you are doing, you do it because you are called. You do it because it's God's mission for your life. You do it because that's what God has purposed for you on this earth, to serve and not to be served. We should have a servant's heart. And so if people aren't thanking me for preaching or they aren't thanking me for the ministry that I'm doing here, I do it because God has called me to do it. I do it because his Holy Spirit has changed me from the inside out and I want to let you know about it. I do it for my calling. And I think some of us should take inspiration from our Savior. If no one thanks us, still grateful. If no one notices me, I'm still grateful. If no one says thank you, I'm still thankful. And when the one leper returned, here's what Jesus said in verses 17 to 19. Jesus asked, were not all the 10 cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except for this foreigner? And this is the important part right here. Then he said, rise and go. Your faith. As, can you finish it? Has made you well. You see, for the other 10 lepers, 
It was God's favor. It was Jesus' favor that got them healed. But for this one leper, because he came back to show him gratitude, Jesus said, your faith has made you well. You see, God is more impressed with your faith than he is with the favor that he's shown upon you. God knows that he's a gracious and merciful God. But when you as a Christian decide to show faith, when you decide to show integrity, when you decide to show mercy and love and a grateful spirit, God is more impressed with your faith than he is with his favor. Because it's always been there. But your faith is developed. Will you be grateful and show faith? Faith that surpasses feelings. And one of the greatest examples of faith and gratefulness that I've ever seen examples by uh, was the life of my auntie Lagena, who passed away last year, last September. Um, man, was this woman a faithful woman. And she was diagnosed with stage four cancer. And most of us, when we're diagnosed with cancer, I don't know what it's like, but most people would find despair and be distraught. But I want to show you an example of what she did after she had lost her hair and after she had gone through difficulty. I'd like to show you a video that was shared at her funeral that hopefully speaks to her gratitude and her faithfulness. I, hello everyone. I was just inspired to sing this song to thank God for his faithfulness and his love for everyone, including myself, my little family. God loves everybody. We just need to come away to his presence in everything, everywhere, especially in our beings. We just need to recognize the presence of God, but he loves you all. He loves us all. So here's his eyes on the sparrow. Why should I feel discouraged? Why should the shadows come? Why should my heart be lonely and long for heaven and home? When A constant friend is he, his eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. I sing because. Yes, I sing because I'm free. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. You see, if gratitude was an attitude, there are many reasons in which that woman should not have been grateful, should not have been praising, should not have been worshiping, but yet even still, she praised God. Even though her body was deteriorating, she was determined in her mind and in her spirit that she was going to give glory and be grateful for all that God has done in her life. You see, that's an example for all of us. I don't just want to be great, grateful from time to time. I'm not just grateful when I feel like it. I'm not grateful when my emotions make me want to be grateful. She had every reason not to be grateful, but yet she praised God. 
Job had every reason not to be grateful when the devil took away everything that he ever loved. And still he said, the Lord giveth and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Paul had every reason not to be grateful when he was in prison. But you know what? He's still encouraged. He's still edified. He's still uplifted and told people to be grateful even from a prison cell. Jesus had every reason not to be grateful when people spat at him, when people threw rocks at him, when they put a thorn, a crown of thorns on his head, when they mocked him and made fun of him. He had every reason not to be grateful, but there was something in these people that made it resolute in their mind to say that despite what I'm going through, I'm still grateful. And how many of you today want to be more grateful? Because if you want to be grateful, it's not just that you have to be grateful when things are going great, but it's when you are going through struggle and difficulty and strife, can you still be grateful for what God has left in your life? Because, check this. Ooh, thank you, Holy Spirit. Just got this, I didn't even write it down. Gratitude. Is not just an attitude, but an attribute. But you know what else gratitude is? Thank you, God, for this. Gratitude is an avenue. Gratitude is an avenue to unlocking the purpose and the goodness of God in your life. When I live a grateful life, it is an avenue that opens up so much more doors for me. It opens up opportunities for me to live within the will of God. You see, this woman may not have made it to see this Thanksgiving day, but if she did, the testimony would be exactly the same. Is gratitude just going to be an attitude for you today? Because if it is, then that's the same as always. Or is it going to be who you are? Is it going to be the essence, the very fiber and the nature that makes up you as a person? Are you going to be a person that is grateful? Which leads me back to our $100 million question. Oh, you thought I forgot about it. I didn't forget it. When I asked this question to the youth group, I said, all right, if somebody gifted you $100 million, what would be the first thing that you did? There was some people said, oh, if I got a hundred million dollars, the first thing I did would do was give it back to the church. I said, that's noble, that's awesome. Some people said I would give money to the homeless. Some people said I would pay off my parents' debt. Some people said I'd buy my family a new house. Some people said I'd uh, start up a business for a passion that I've always wanted. And to those people, I said, that's great. Those are noble. Those are things to pursue. Those are, those are all great things. I appreciate that. It shows your values and, and your character. But I said, I phrased that question in a very particular way to give you a very specific answer. Because I know what the first thing you would do if somebody gave you $100 million. And you know what the first thing you would do? You would thank the person who gave you $100 million. If somebody gave me $100 million, I'd be like, are you serious? And I would immediately start saying, thank you, thank you, thank you. Make sure the check is real, right? But thank that person immensely. And the way that it relates to God is this. You and I have been gifted with a gift that is worth far more than $100 million. You and I have been gifted with a gift that no monetary value could even quantify. You and I have been gifted a gift that is eternity with Jesus. That's worth far more than any riches could buy. Because when I die, my riches are gone. But my spirit remains forever. What are you going to do with the gift that God has given you? I'll ask it again. What are you going to do with the gift 
that God has given you? Are you going to live the same way as you've always lived? Or are you going to live grateful forever for all that God has done for you in your life? Are you going to be grateful for the salvation that he has freely given you? The reason why I say that $100 million was gifted to you, because did you do anything to deserve grace? No. Grace in its very nature is unmerited favor, unmerited love. We didn't do anything. And yet, while we were still sinners, Christ still died for us. And he loved us. And he loves you and you and you and you and me too. And one way in which you can respond is by making him the Lord and Savior of your life. And starting this process of becoming a person who is grateful. And so at this time, I'd like to give the opportunity. Everyone standing, no one moving. Can you dim the lights for me, Junior? Everyone standing in this moment. I'd like to give the opportunity for somebody who has not accepted Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. I'd like to give you and invite you the opportunity to do so. 